clean up of what I'm gonna say. My gosh, they're all going against the wind. It was basically a cube with inside of a sphere where the points of the cube uh, were touching outside of the sphere. So this isn't anything that just is limited to the United States. It's a worldwide phenomenon. Hi everyone and welcome to That UFO Podcast. My name is Andy and very much looking forward to introducing this week's guest. As you will know, it's been long overdue. I have author, researcher, my UAP media colleague, and of course, friend, Mr. Graham Rendell joining me. Graham, long time no speak. Yeah, Andy, just a few days ago, wasn't it? Uh, it, it seems just like that. It seems just a few days ago. Uh, Graham, recently we got to meet face to face for the second time. Uh, we're actually the only people from UAP Media that have met. Well, actually, Dan and Dave once met um, for a kind of catch up, which was nice. But we're all going to be meeting up in a couple of weeks for a little get together in London, which I'm very much looking forward to. But uh, we have shared a coffee and we've also shared a road trip now, haven't we? We went to Creston for the UFO awesome. Minicon, which was uh, pretty enjoyable. It was, yeah, it was a great day out, but it was also a good opportunity to have a good chat on the way down and on the way back. So yeah, it was a, it was a worthwhile day all around. And it was nice to meet some of the listeners as well. Uh, Nick, as we drove up and got out of the car, had one of Dan's t-shirts on, which was extremely surreal to see it in the flesh and, and not virtually. Uh, we talked to Frank from the UFO Thinker podcast, Barry was there, Dave was there. And I hope I've not missed anyone else out. Ash, of course, Abigail, who put on the, the event, uh, and it was a lot of fun. So I really enjoyed that and look forward to kind of getting to more of those and getting to meet more people in the hopefully not too distant future. And maybe eventually getting across the pond as well to the States. That would be that would be pretty cool to do that one day as well, wouldn't it? It certainly would, yeah. Uh, I really look forward to the time where we can do that kind of thing. Well, if enough people buy your book, you'll be able to afford flights over, Graham, aren't you? And we're going to be talking about your book, which is UFOs Before Roswell, European Foo Fighters, 1940 to 1945. People will not believe I didn't plan that, Graham, but there you go. Uh, it's just just skill, I think. Uh, and Graham Rendell is, of course, the author, forward by the wonderful Mr. Sean Cahill. And for anyone listening, yes, Sean Cahill is the artist who records the outro to the podcast, so that funky tune that everyone gets in touch with me constantly throughout the week is uh, Sean Cahill slash Minty Hyperspace and it's called Goblin Problems I should probably fit that one in just now and uh, I would love for Sean to one day do a, an acoustic version or a live performance on the podcast that would be pretty good but listen Graham, this show is all about and all for you and I want to find out a little bit about you, the man behind the book obviously so can you tell the listeners Graham a little bit about your background and do you know what? What's brought you to writing books about UFOs? And also, we're going to talk a little bit about some of the fascinating places you've traveled to. Okay. So from an early age, about four or five years old, my mum started buying me airfix kits of model aircraft, basically to keep me quiet, just keep me out of the way. Um, now, those air, those models had little potted histories of, of the aircraft that you were building. So it was like a little history, a couple of paragraphs only. But that got was enough to get my interest in aircraft started and after that i just wanted to read everything i could find so that was books you know magazines all the rest of it going to the library getting them for christmas uh, presents and birthday presents so i just built up a big library and, and a lot of information about airplanes that took me into the war as well because my mother and my father had lived through it and i was regaled with tales of you know bombing raids and, and all this kind of thing so my interest kick-started in the war that way as well and then i was interested in science fiction from about maybe i don't know seven eight eight nine years old Old. Um, and I amassed a library of science fiction books which had nice pictures of spacecraft on the front. Then my mum thought she was doing me a favour one day and she bought me a book which had a flying saucer on the front of it. She thought it was another one of these Isaac Asimov novels that she, I was reading um, at, that, at that time. It wasn't. It was a book by uh, Brinsley Lepoa Trench. It was Mysterious Visitors and it was a UFO book. And that's how my interest in UFOs start, because uh, because that's that really really fired up my imagination onto things that could be. Uh, you know, all the things I was reading about in science fiction novels seem to be actually true. 
you know, spacecraft from other worlds, aliens, all that kind of thing. So it was a, yeah, it was a, it was a, it was a revelation, really. It, it and something that's never really left me to this day. And you've grown up in a time then where science fiction was becoming extremely popular. That was a bit of a boom period. We're looking, I don't want to get your age badly wrong here, Graham, but we're <laughs> late 60s, early 70s. We had the Star Trek series was big and yep. a lot of other huge sci-fi shows that would have, of course, still been on television going forward. The books, the magazines and, and all that stuff that would have been around that. So you can see where that interest has come from. But growing up, you you managed to get to some fascinating places. And your your first book that was published earlier on this year was all about Siberia. And it was quite a niche book, which we discussed, obviously, on our travels. Do you want to tell the listeners a little bit about that? Yeah. Um, at the end of 1991, I, I actually had the chance to uh, sign up for a trip around northeastern Siberia in the summer of 1992. So at the end of June that year, I, I travelled out with about another sort of 30 or 40 people who had signed up for this venture. And we all had the money pooled so we could hire uh, what was actually an iceberg spotting aircraft that had been used by Polar Aviation of Aeroflot. Uh, and we went round um, a lot of northeastern Siberian airfields. We had to leave that aircraft at another base because it was too big to get into some of these little gravel fields that we were flying into. And you had like, you know, the, the gravel from the strip was bouncing off the propeller blades and, and all that kind of thing as we were flying into these little strips. And this was actually right up near the Arctic coast. It was only about an hour's, maybe an hour and a half's flying time from, from uh, Alaska. So it was a really remote part of the world. Uh, we were flying over polar bears, which looked like big dirty sheep, you know, that kind of things so it was uh it was a very very strange time and of course this was only six months after the fall of the soviet union so it was a weird time in terms of what they what they would let us do um so we got into some really kind of odd places which westerners just hadn't got to before and we're probably the the last they'll have got there as well because no nobody else as far as i'm aware visited the places that we actually got to so that book that i wrote is a kind of travelogue it's not just for aircraft enthusiasts it, it's a real book about you know traveling to one of the last wildernesses on the planet so yeah it's um i like to think it's a really good read but it covers a, co a couple of bases so if people are interested in russian aircraft and the soviet union there's something for them in there as well and that book is To the Ends of the Earth, if I remember that correctly. That's right, yes. Excellent. I've not got that written down in front of me, right off the top of my head there, Graham. Now, yeah, again, if you, people want to check that one out, it's, it's very niche, but fascinating place. Some really interesting pictures in there as well. I love it. Everyone likes a picture book to flick through to, so there's some pretty cool images in there as well. But Graham, that's then brought you to, you've written that book, you've obviously got a taste for it, and you're a very very is very capable offer the right way to say it because i've never written a book but you write very well and you've not had anyone write it for you you've then gone on to very quickly write another book which of course is what we discussed before ufos before roswell european foo fighters 1940 to 1945 what brought you to then move on from writing about northeastern siberian airfields to ufos in the 1940s as I said before, I grew up in a time when um, you know, science fiction was quite on the ascendant, but also UFO books were as well. So you had a, a kind of golden age in the, in the 50s and 60s where people were just getting into kind of writing about UFOs. But things had settled down by the 70s and 80s, and you were seeing a kind of chronology of of events that were happening so you would get the mystery airships in the 1890s you have the, the the ghost aircraft from the 20s and 30s but then there would be this gap over the second world war and it would just leap straight across to the ghost rockets of 1946 and then to kenneth arnold and roswell in 1947 and there was this kind of you know, six-year gap from 39 to 45 and of course that was a period of time i was really interested in um given the fact that you know, i was interested in both aviation and world war ii so you just kind of thought, well, why is this? Why is this gap? Why are there no reports from there? Actually, it turned out there were, but it was only a handful, and they were based on a, a one particular magazine article from December 1945, where it had half a dozen reports from a U.S. night fighter squadron based in France in over the winter of 44-45, plus a couple of reports from the Pacific and one from a daylight um, raid over Germany in about, I think it was 1940, early 1945. And those nine reports were basically all people had to go on for about 50 years, with the exception of a couple of other reports which came out of the woodwork and appeared in, in um, books from, by Tim Good and a few other authors. Um, and also, if you looked at a few kind of niche publications like Flying Saucer Review and a couple from the States, there were a few other stories, but they weren't widespread at all. But so those like really small number of cases represented the entire Foo Fighters kind of phenomenon. 
And I thought, well, come on, that, that, it can't just be that. You know, if you look across the, the last 70 years, the UFO kind of phenomenon has been really widespread right across the planet. And, you know, lots of reports every year. And yet the wartime has only got, what, nine, like 10 reports? It didn't make any sense. So I thought there must be more to it than just that. But for years, I haven't really been in a position to do anything about it for work, except for things like that. Just haven't had the time. Um, but at the start of the year, or just before Christmas, I sort of thought, yeah, the, I might be able to try and find something here. And I just set about trying to find some more cases beyond what was already in the public realm. Um, and I just started finding things, right, really. And that's where the germ of the book came from. Now, before we get to talking about World War II, 1940 to 1945, was there anything reported during the previous World War? Yes, there are. There, there, there was a book, I can't remember the, t- the title of it now, but there is a book available and um, which does detail some of the weird things that were seen during the First World War. Um, so uh, there is, uh, and Sean Cahill actually mentioned this on, on, a, on a podcast I was uh, that he, he popped up on at, at just this last weekend, and he, he, he believes there was a story of a, of a tic-tac-shaped uh, aircraft and a mothership uh, that was seen over uh, over the battlefield in World War One, so there are some interesting stories which have come out of there. Um, I'm not aware of them too much because that's not something I've focused on. But I am aware of the book itself, and um, one day I hope to have a look at it and read it for myself. Just can't remember the title of it offhand. Graham, you mentioned you're a, a child of that science fiction era. You grew up in a, a real boom period for that particular genre, but you people didn't necessarily have that sort of literature. Uh, I'm going to quote yourself uh, when we discussed this on KGRA, the, the lexicon at the time, the language of the time. We didn't really have flying saucers. Were people talking about aliens or, or spaceships even back then in the 40s and before? I mean, a few people were, but it wasn't many, and it certainly wasn't widespread. So the actual kind of, um, you know, people's mindset was never towards things like that. And of course, when it came to the war, when they were experiencing things that they couldn't understand, that was the last thing on the mind. In fact, it wasn't even on their minds at all. So everything was couched in the language of German secret weapons, rather than aliens, rather than flying saucers, rather than beings from another world. All those things never, ever featured. If you look through the intelligence reports and all the other information from back then, nothing is ever mentioned about the possibility of these being from somewhere else. Now, you mentioned the you know German secret weaponry potentially mm-hmm. at the point. It was a time where the skies were filled with rockets, bombs, various flashes, strange lights that people wouldn't have been used to seeing, and a whole range of different aircraft from, from various different countries throughout the world. Was it difficult at the time for people to spot something that was potentially anomalous? And how have you come to picking those reports that have eventually ended up as cases in your book? The, the crews were very well trained. So when they went through basic training, they were giving a lot of ground lectures on the different types of enemy aircraft and also their own aircraft so they didn't shoot their own side down. So you, you had hours and hours and hours of training before they would let them up in the air. So that wasn't just pilots. That would be navigators for gunners, you know, bombers. Everybody who went up in the air had at least you know the kind of modicum of training so they could spot what they were going to see up there. So it didn't become like too much of a kind of a, of a, of a new thing. So they would know they know the difference between a Spitfire or a Meshnet, you know, or a Henkel or a Dornier. Um, and that was all just like, you know, kind of sort of thrown at them all the time until the head, you know, until their ears bled kind of thing. So when they went up, they were well prepared for what they would see. And of course, when you went to a squadron, there was always people who were on the squadron before you. So you always got to know about what was going to be in there before you even got airborne, because people talked to each other and you had intelligence briefings before you went up in the air anyway. So you got an idea of what to expect. But as people did mission after mission, providing they weren't shot down or killed, um, then they actually got to know what was happening in any case. So they could tell the difference between Allied targeting flares, which like the green, yellow, red, blue lights that were dropped on targets to make sure that you know the bomb we were dropping our bombs in the right place. The Germans had decoy flares, but they were much lower down, and because of the delivery system they employed, they also used things called fighter flares, which were um, dropped just above the cloud layer to silhouette the bombers for their own night fighters. But they were known phenomena. So all these things, they, they did actually know what they were. And they are reported in the official information because you mentioned about how I found this information out. So you can see all this information listed because the squadron reporting 
on the whole, is pretty good. However, it can be patchy. So on the best reports, some of the best squadrons where they have the most diligent staff in terms of recording what was going on for each mission, for each aircraft, you get a lot of information. You don't just get that information about the stuff that they knew. So by the time they dropped the bombs and how much uh, kind of night fighter activity there was and flak activity and um, you know the times that they took off from the land and all this kind of stuff. Then there's also information about this kind of weird thing. So um, kind of what they called rockets, which would zig and zag after the aircraft, all these strange lights uh, and some other things as well. There's a whole gamut of, of like strange, weird phenomenon that was listed in some of these really good reports. But then other squadrons, of course, weren't so diligent in the reporting of the intelligence information in the official files. So you would get summaries for one raid rather than individual aircraft that participated. And then in some of the other squadrons, you would get next to nothing. So you wouldn't even get the, the luxury of reading through a summary of what happened for that particular raid. So those la last two categories, you probably think there might be some actual reports tucked away in there, but for the fact that they were never actually written down. And then when you look at some of the, um, the more widely reported cases, the ones that actually did make some of the UFO books in the 90s, and then you try and track down those squadrons that were involved and find the personnel and find the raid and look into those, Actually, they're not listed either, and it's just down to the pilot because for some reason, or, or whoever whoever witnessed it, but that information is not even in the squadron records either. But it turns out that you know people have actually talked about it after the war. But some of the stories are in the official uh, in the official documentation as well. So there's a whole you know whole lot of things going on here. There's there's no one hard and fast rule for everything that actually happened. Um, so we're just lucky that actually I managed to find as much as I did. Now. All the stuff I talked about before about the American uh, sightings, that, that kind of group that were in that magazine article, and some of the stuff that happened in the books afterwards. Well, there have been things added to that. Keith Chester wrote a great book called Strange Company back in 2007. And that was probably the, one of the first books that actually had anything beyond those particular, that small subset of information about the Foo Fighters. And he had some really good cases in there. Um, when I looked at it, unfortunately, I, I found some errors. I found some errors in terms of a year of a sighting and some other dates and some names and types of aircraft. So when I dug into it, um, you know, I managed to rectify those things for my book. But also, I found a whole lot more as well. Um, there were stories from the Balkans in 1944 that were never, ever listed anywhere else. And yet that squadron information, the, the squadron information for those units is great. It's really well documented, and they've got story after story after story of these strange lights and what they called rockets chasing after aircraft. And those are really good. Those are really good tales, which I include in the book. Let me ask Graham, when we talk about secret German technology, there are all sorts of wild and crazy rumors around. Mm. You know, the, the most famous ones like Dig Locker. You know, the the Bell yeah. aircraft they were looking at, various different hovercraft that were being experimented with. How much stock do you put into? a lot of this being German secret technology, is it mostly rumour? Because surely if they had even a, a, a fraction of the technology that is rumoured or written about, the outcome of the war would have been very different. Well, you'd think so, wouldn't you? There's a, the, I'll just quote an example in terms of how actually the Germans were going backwards at the end of the war. Everybody seems to think they had all this super secret technology and it was just on the point of getting fielded. Now, that was true to a certain point until about the last nine months of the war. But because of the pressure on German industry and uh, German testing sites and all the rest of it, they were actually going backwards. They were excited, so desperate that they were looking back to things they'd already invented to try and strap onto aircraft in terms of engines just to get aircraft up in the air to attack our own bombers and, and things like that. And they were, they were experimenting with things that they'd already decided weren't worth it, like uh, the pulse jet from a, a V1 flying bomb. They were then, because they'd worked out that that engine couldn't be used for a fighter aircraft because it, its performance dropped off after you went a few thousand feet up in the air, because the V1 didn't, didn't fly that high, and you couldn't take off with it because it didn't deliver enough power to get you airborne. You had to use like an auxiliary type of power to get you up in the air in the first place. The Germans still started designing aircraft right over Christmas 1944 that actually had these things as power plants. And they were serious in trying to field them, even though it was a complete nutter waste of time. So there's a whole load of kind of things that you look at, and the Germans weren't actually as good as everybody thinks they were. And then if you look at the history of flak rockets or so anti-aircraft rockets, service-to-air missiles, you know, as they were, 
it was a very protracted campaign for trying to get these things into the air. They didn't work properly. They were they were um, looking at things like guidance systems that they couldn't get their head around because it was all new technology. So and they weren't getting to grips with it. And these things were never fielded. They were never put into operational service, even though they had about fifty different types in development throughout the war. So they spent they threw a lot of money, a lot of resources, and a lot of time at a lot of things which didn't work in the end, or never got to the point where they could put them in service. So it was a bit of a disaster, really. Um, and these these kind of resources could have been thrown at things which might have tipped the war in terms of numbers, but they just you know that they splurged it on things like the V two, which actually wasn't that effective when you come when you look at it in you know in a kind of scientific way. And the V one flying bomb again, which didn't you know didn't do huge amounts of damage in terms of the strategic sense. So yeah, the, um, people give them too much credit for a lot of these things. I go into a huge amount of detail in the book about the things that people have said the Foo Fighters were, but it turns out, no, that they weren't. They couldn't have been for a whole variety of reasons, which I haven't really got time to go into here. Now, you mentioned just a few moments ago, Graham, that the, the pilots of the time were, were very highly trained. Now, would that be highly trained comparatively of the time because we hear about today's top gun pilots your your david fravers your alex dietrichs your ryan graves that they are some of the you know the elite pilots in the world can we say that they compare to the pilots of the 40s would they compare to now or is it a totally different level it's a totally different level now because the, the technology today is so sophisticated that you can't just um, train a pilot to fly a jet within a few hours and, and send them off into the air. Whereas, say, in 1940, uh, when you know the Battle of Britain, we were training pilots and they were getting maybe 20 hours of basic training, 10 hours in the Spitfire if they were lucky, and then they were sent up to fight the Germans. So that was your kind of training. But that wasn't the entire training. That was just to fly the plane. But they were getting kind of ground lectures in, in how to you know, navigate gate and how to um you know how to tell what what a german aircraft looked like rather than a british aircraft and then of course when they were sent up for advanced training they were showing how to fire the guns at at the most optimum distance and things like all this kind of thing was shown to them and then of course if you were a bomber crew then you had individual trades so you were a pilot or a navigator you're a gunner bomb a flight engineer all these different trades had their associate training which involved either ground lectures or things up in the air but you know for the time it was quite sophisticated it was quite lengthy and they wouldn't let people up into the air if they weren't good enough now the instruments of today are immeasurably different that you're, you're looking at hundreds of millions of dollars just in one aircraft and that technology is we, we probably only hear about the tip of the iceberg in terms of what the readings these pilots can get what sort of instruments were on board at the time during the, the 40s that a pilot could get any sort of reading from but more importantly, they could potentially have an effect or a reading when it comes to coming in close counters with a UFO. So you're talking about airborne radar. Um, it was already sort of invented by the start of the war. So we had a, ne a network of ground radar stations already in place at the start of World War II. It wasn't complete by any means. It didn't ring around the whole country, but we had it. The Germans had it as well, but they were a little bit slower in developing some of it, but they did have their own systems. Now, in terms of airborne radar, so a system, uh, a set that can go into an aircraft and fly, that took a little bit longer. And both Germany and Britain had a kind of cat and mouse game where we were just developing bits and they would develop their own bit and those countermeasures and all the rest of it, backwards and forwards, because it was a kind of electronic, say a cat and mouse game to see who would be on the ascendant at any one particular time uh, in, during the war. But airborne radar itself, you, the sets that they had were fairly rudimentary. They didn't even have, at the start with, they didn't even have scanners like you'd see on, on, you know, on an aircraft today where the, the dish goes around in the, in the nose of an airplane. And also the, the actual radar operator inside the airplane wouldn't have a kind of, you know, the, the little kind of display wouldn't go around with a little, the little di uh, blip on it uh, you see on the films. He was looking at something that looked like an oscilloscope display, so it's like a bouncing kind of like you know kind of chart, and he had to try and decipher that to work out what the altitude was and the speed was and, and, the, and the bearing of the air, of, of the target, and they had to be actually vectored to the, towards the targets by ground radar. So if somebody was radioing the pilot to say you've got to steer this way, you know the aircraft's such and such in front of you, and only within about the next you know within about five miles of the target could the airborne set actually pick up the target that they were trying to chase and shoot down so they were very very rudimentary very you know sort of just early kind of technology that wasn't that good but it was it was cutting edge for the time 
was there any cases of interference with any of the equipment on board the, the aircraft, you know, malfunctions in terms of any of these encounters with Foo Fighters? So most of the time, the Foo Fighters, in terms of the American sightings over the winter of 44, 45, both over uh, Belgium and France and, and Germany, and also over northern Italy, because this is where a lot of them were seen, they didn't register on radar. There's actually a particular case where one of these lights was chasing around after this uh, after an American night fighter, and they managed to lose it eventually, or it flew off rather. And the exasperated pilot radioed the ground radar station to say, you know, can you see it on your radar system? And said, well, no, you're the only person up there. So most of the time they weren't being picked up on radar. However, there are effects because there's a case which I have in the book, and it's right at the end of the RAF section. It's the last bombing raid of the war, and a pilot. Uh, it was an Australian pilot on an RAF squadron flying over Germany. And there was this huge, what he called a blanket, flew past the front of the aircraft. And there were no any of the target. They were still half an hour short of it. And they had these 12,000 pound, what they call tall boy bombs. It was a like a, a earthquake bomb. It was designed to basically penetrate the ground, explode and knock down railway viaducts or, or submarine pens, this kind of thing. It was, a, it was an earthquake weapon. And the bomb actually detached itself from the shackles of the, the aircraft and bounced out of the bomb bay. It, it crashed through the bomb bay doors and fell away because this thing had flung past them. And they lost all power on the aircraft as well. And the aircraft basically fell out the sky. Um, and he had been a test pilot and he knew how to restart engines, all this kind of thing, in a minimum amount of time. And he managed to get the engines restarted and they pulled out the dive before they crashed into the ground. But there was also effects on the crew because they got started to get really bad headaches and things like that. And they were kept in hospital for a while, according to the pilot's recollections. Um, and some people might know of uh, James McDonald, who was a, a scientist. And he um, he went around, Amer he was an Australian, but he went around, um, sorry, he was American, but he went around Australia uh, collecting our, um, uh, sighting reports uh, by audiovisual uh, methods in the 60s. He committed suicide at the end. He was um, he was castigated for his views about UFOs. And he was the one who actually interviewed this pilot. And I've got, I actually managed to get a hold of a, a, a transcript of the interview. Uh, and it's fascinating stuff about what this pilot says that happened. But that's a particular case in the book. So yeah, there are effects, um, not only to equipment, but also to personnel. And that's that biological effects that we're hearing about that's more, right, yeah. more recently as well off the back of the, the sixth, Skinwalker the book. The sixth observable. Yes, the, the famed sixth observable, yeah. So that's really interesting. And you wonder how many pilots who did come into contact with these went on in life to have any number of health problems that I, I have no doubt would have been attributed to their time in conflict or the war or the conditions that they were they were a part of or just being put down to to kind of biological effects of, of whatever normal life would have been at the time. Um, did all sides report Foo Fighters? What, was it coming from the Germans, the US, the British, and, and all other sides? So certainly the RAF and the American Army Air Corps, uh, Air Force, sorry, they were definitely reporting things. You can see things in the official documentation. Now, I wish I had a quid for every time somebody's come up to me and said, well, the Germans saw them too, you know, Graham. Well, I've heard those stories. I've read those reports in terms of they appear in on Internet websites and things like that. But actually tracking down the German sightings is much more difficult. Now, that's a, probably a combination because of the fact that the official records are in German and they didn't report things in the same way as the RAF and the Americans did. And also the Americans basically took a lot of the records away with them at the end of the war. But also the Germans destroyed a lot of their Air Force records. Um, so there's like complete years which were you know either missing or, or half or half complete because of the kind of way that they destroyed the records before before the end of hostilities. Now the stories that I have been able to find for the book are few and far between, but there are some. However, some of them are, let's say, you have to take them with a bit of pitch and salt for various reasons, which we can get into a bit later if you want. So yes, there are stories, but their pedigree may be a bit suspect. But I, I, could, I would love to be able to get into the archives sometimes. I'm not fluent in German. I know some of the German technical and military terms, enough to be able to read things. But being able to find the records and find details of Foo Fighter reports or similar might be quite difficult. Um, as far as I'm aware, nobody in Germany has actually done it. But I would have thought that that would be the best place you know, for somebody to start would be for a German national who's interested in UFOs to try and have a go of themselves. In terms of Russian reports, yes, there are Russian reports as well. 
Um, now, you have to remember, bear in mind that UF, ufology was a forbidden subject in the Soviet Union, albeit for a six-month period in about 1969 when there was a bit of kind of glasnost over that and they were allowed to talk about it before they clamped down again. Now, after the wall came down and the, the Russia sort of opened up a bit, people started traveling there and getting information. Uh, you, your friend uh, George Knapp did that in 1993. Um, other people did as well. And there's a lot of other people since. So information came out during the early 1990s about a whole range of UFO reports, not just from the World War II, but from, you know, from other periods in history as well. Now, there are stories that came out about that time from Second World War and things that happened on the Eastern Front. But... <sighs> My experiences of traveling around Russia led me to sort of suspect some of these because there was always a lot of things going on where they realized that Westerners were asking them for various things and prepared to pay money. And of course, if, you didn't, if they didn't have the goods, they were quite happy to make things up. You know, we found that out. You know, by by pro they were promising things that they, if we would pay them some money or give them some bribes, then they would deliver. And it turned out it didn't happen, you know, even after you paid the money, sort of thing. So. I can see that some of these reports may have been embellished or even just made up because, you know, it, to satisfy demand. Having said that, some of the stories undoubtedly are, are true to the, to a point. So it's difficult to tell what the, you know, how true they are in the end. Um, one of them appeared on a, a 1994 Network First documentary in Britain. Uh, and I do include that one in the, in the, in, in the book as well, because that's quite a well-known story uh, of, a, of a, 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 a Russian general. Uh, well, he, he actually was a general in the 1990s when he told the story. He ended up as a general of their rocket forces. So he, he, he actually you know, rose up the ranks of, uh, of their military to a quite a high level and a very responsible level. So he's not probably somebody who might just tell tall stories. And he'd seen a kind of teardrop-shaped thing which had, um, which had flown past his aircraft on a bombing raid in 1944, I believe it was. So yeah, the stories from Russia. There are stories, of course, from the Pacific as well, but that's not something I covered in the book because I kept the focus on Europe. But yeah, the, there are stories from all over Europe. There are also stories from French civilians. But then again, those stories came out after the war because no self-respecting Frenchman or woman was going to tell the German authorities that seen something strange because it would end up in a labour camp. Now, it's probably a good place to bring in that uh, at your recent appearance at the UFO Minicon we attended in Preston, you've done a fantastic presentation. Uh, and as part of this, you also covered some stories from that time that you quite rightly pointed out were fabricated or hoaxes. And you gave some nice examples of, of why those were as well. What is the background to some of these? Yeah, have to work out what people's motivation are just for like telling porkies in terms of, uh, you know, UFO reports right through history anyway. And some people will do it because they want to jump on a bandwagon. Some people do it for fan financial means, but other people just want to do it because they want a little bit of that kind of stardom. And I'm not sure, entirely sure where the hoax has come from, but I know what the one hoax came from a, an author in, in France in 1970 who actually wrote something in a book because he wanted to expose people who had been plagiarizing his work. So that's where that hoax came from. But there's also another one about um, a, an RAF pilot, or he said he was a pilot. And that turns out in a book by a fairly well-respected British author in the 1990s. Um, and it's the story of a, of a pilot who was at an intelligence briefing after a raid. He was with his crew and they, were talk and they were talking to the intelligence officer, but they overheard, or he overheard the next crew at the next table talking to another officer about some spheres which had followed their Lancaster bullet. He gave the author of the book, you know, some details about the squadron he was flying in and the time of the war where this incident had apparently taken place. And he gave a specific time. Now, with that information, I could track down his particular position in that squadron. And I go into this in the book. So I looked him up and it turns out he wasn't a pilot. He was a flight engineer. So the ranks wrong straight away. I did a bit more digging. And it turned out that when he said the raid occurred, it didn't happen then. It happened about seven weeks later. And when I looked at the raid, he wasn't, he, he didn't feature on it. So I looked into a bit more of his history and I could find from the squadron documents that he actually either stopped being air crew on the squadron or he left the squadron at the beginning of the month we said the, bo the bombing raid took place towards the end of the month. So he wasn't even flying with the squadron. So he couldn't have been where he said he was and the position he was at the time he said he was. So that story, you have to think, okay, well, you know, if all that's wrong, then 
what's the pedigree of the story? Is that is that going to be you know kosher as well, or is that just going to be a pack of lies? So I'm not going to say out and out that it is lies, but the rest of the story is incorrect. So therefore, you have to sort of like you know treat the story itself with a bit of a pinch of salt. Um, and there are other stories like that as well. And um, unfortunately, that's the same right through ufology. You know, if anybody writes a book, chances are there might be one or two stories in it which may be complete fabrications, but these ones have come up and you, you see them on websites and you see them in other books. And I just want to make sure that people are aware that these ones probably aren't real. Uh, so you just don't perpetuate myths because that's the last thing that people want to do in ufology. You know, if you see something that's wrong, you should call it out. And I think that speaks to your integrity and the integrity of the book as well, that you can point out that. And again, like we try to do on this show and if myself and Dan are having those discussions, like recently with the, the rubber duck flare video, mm. where we would almost guarantee it's nothing anomalous and it is more than likely a quadcopter drone with something masking the heat signatures. And I know we're not an expert on this, but we've, we've spoken to enough experts that allow us to arrive at that conclusion. And I think you have to do that in this subject. Otherwise, you get into a pitfall of everything's a UFO. Everything's from mm. Alpha Centauri or somewhere exotic. And that's just not the case. And it's not how the subject works. What I would ask you, though, Graham, is was there a general consensus by those pilots encountering these objects as to what they might be seeing? They had various theories um, at the time that they they knew what they weren't. So they knew there weren't things like Sir Elmo's fire. And also those kind of things about you know static electricity charges, ball lightning. They had an idea that it wasn't these things that they they they'd heard of because some of those fires like things that flies up you know goes up and down aerials or, or dances around propeller blades it was a known phenomenon they also had an idea that they weren't um some types of german kind of secret weapon because they didn't act the same way but they were still kind of in that mindset that because everybody else sort of thought well they must be german secret weapons this is what they must be as well so they were expecting the next thing to come down the track they just hadn't seen it. So what were these lights that were flying around chasing after their aircraft? Well, they must be German secret weapons because what else could they be? So it was still that kind of thinking, but they weren't able to, they didn't have enough information. So they didn't have crashed Foo Fighters, if you like, to look at and to examine. Um, all they had were just, you know, these sightings of lights to go on. So they, in the back of their minds, they kept thinking, yes, there's something German, and we're going to find out what it is after the end of the war. And of course, that was the thinking that went right through the intelligence community and also senior officers who, who had had anything to do with the subject. So um, that was their thinking. The crews, obviously, at a lower level without so much information, just kept thinking, well, yeah, it's going to be something German that we're going to find out, you know, after everything's all, after everything's done and dusted. So that was that was pretty much what, you know, what they thought of. Anything else? Was it going to be German? Was it going to be alien? Was it going to be a flying saucer? No, nothing like that. They, they didn't think in those terms at all. Graham, what do you think people were seeing when they were encountering these objects, the Foo Fighters, UFOs? What you've described them previously, you know, we've seen spheres, cigar-shaped mm -hmm. objects, long torpedoes with portholes. Uh, what, what was your best theory as to what they may have been? So in the book, I've basically set out to say what they're not, because I'm afraid I can't sit here today and tell you what they were. And I don't really have too much of a theory as to what they are beyond they're probably an earlier manifestation of what was seen 1947 you know, onwards. And that's all I can do. I can tell you that they're probably not, with a fair degree of certainty, they're not German secret weapons and of any type whether they were air, uh, jet aircraft or rocket aircraft or rockets or something else that they were cooking up. You know, you talk about the Glocker, which to me is uh, is just a myth for various reasons, which, which I won't go into here. But um, there's a whole load of reasons which I do go into in the book, which basically, you know, sort of turn the kind of idea that they were German secret weapons on their head because there's a whole ra range of reasons why that simply couldn't be the case. And rather than spoil it for people, you know, they can read the book and see my reasoning. Um, and if anybody does think that they have a better idea and, oh, it is this German secret weapon, and here's the reason why, then I I'm all ears. You know, I'd love to hear from them. But as far as I can see, and from the information I uh, either know about or I've read about or I've asked people about, I can't see it. And I put all that reasoning down. That leaves... The question is what they what they were. Well, if you can, you know, get rid of the, the things that they're not, that actually does leave you in a better place to try and work it out. Having said that, you'll know, you know, ufology is another thing that you can pin down. We don't know what these things are. 
my best guess, as you as you ask me, is literally that they are just a, a manifestation of what we're seeing, you know, from forty seven onwards. Um, but what that is, I'm sorry uh, if anybody's ask, thinking I'm going to tell them right now, they're going to be sadly disappointed because I, I simply don't know. Was there anything that you really wanted to get into the book, but you couldn't for any particular reason? You, you're a man who likes to report the fact, report the facts, mm. as, as you've just kind of basically said there with your statement previously. Uh, maybe some cases that you would have added, but for for lack of data, they've been left on the cutting room floor. Yeah, there's plenty of well, there are some Russian and, and German cases which you sort of look at and you think mm, there's not enough there. They're too flimsy. You know, you don't even get dates. You don't get places. They're just kind of reports of the light. Uh, and, and that's all it is. So you can't put them in. There's also a few RF cases like that as well, which I couldn't get enough information on to actually, it wasn't worth putting in the book because you don't want just to fill a book about cases of, of a strange light without a date and without a time and all the rest of it. The German cases themselves, I mentioned before about not being able to get into the official records. That's what I really sort of, like you know I'm, I'm most annoyed about if you like not being able to do that uh, and that's just out the fact that because covid i couldn't travel but also the fact that i can't even begin to work out where those records might be that let alone look through them so that that's something that you know would have to be done in the future by maybe someone much more qualified than myself so if i, if I have any regrets it's not being able to tell the other side of the story because there's lots of anecdotal evidence that say well the germans saw them too and they weren't sure either but proving that's a different matter you know, it's all very well saying people are coming up with stories saying well that's what happened but yeah i want you to point me to a file that can show me that information or you know some other document you know some intelligence information all the rest of it i just haven't seen it and i have looked but i can't find it so that, that's that's a bit i regret i'm afraid that's 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 a fair fair uh, assumption before we get to listener questions and some of those i've I wanted to follow up on a few of your points, but we've got a few good list of questions that do that kind of nicely for me, and I want to give the listeners the the credit for that. It is crash retrieval week, um, or it's it's about to have just finished potentially, depending if you're listening to this on the Patreon or Apple Premium, or you're listening to it on the, the free interview when it comes out. Are there any related events around the time of, of World War Two as you know, would point to a potential crash of any of these objects. You mentioned before pilots didn't collect anything to say so, but you would think with so much artillery in the skies, the odds of something maybe coming down would be a little bit higher. You would think so. And um, actually, there aren't many stories of... Um... Which I'm able to just fall out. <laughs> there, are, um, there are many stories of landings. So, you know, never mind crashes, but there are a few in terms of things that came down and may well have been retrieved. However, these fall into the brackets of kind of not flimsy, but not much information to go on. So I'll give you a couple. Um, and they both happen in Russia and both in 1941. So even before the German invasion kicked off in June 1941, there's a report of a, well, they called it, and the description was an aircraft without wings make of that what you want and it crashed on an island in the middle of the river don in the middle of the city of rostov which is the sort of if you go into the kind of northeast corner of the sea as azov which is just off the black sea that part of the crimea uh, of the, uh, the donbass area it's a big industrial area in russia it was back in world war ii and this this thing crashed there on this island it's a small grass island it's like a little park in the middle of the city and apparently, if you believe the reports, where those reports come from is a different matter. But truckloads of Soviet soldiers came and took it away. Where they took it away from, uh, took it away to, sorry, I just don't know. Um, and that's the end of the story. So there's one. And then later on the same year in, in Belarus, or what we call now Belarus, between two villages in rural Belarus, the, another craft came down. And again, the description is pretty vague, other than troops from the NKVD, which is the forerunner to the KGB, so that was their political soldiers. They came along and whisked it away and took it to a facility in a place called Omsk, which is on the other side of the Ural Mountains in, the, in Western Siberia. Now, at that time of the war, the Russians were moving all their heavy industry and their technical bureaus and all the rest of it to the other side of the Urals to get them out of the way of the German invasion. So that particular part of the story could be correct. But unfortunately, just down to kind of, you know, the, the things that the reporting in the Soviet Union, the secrecy and all the rest of it, there is probably no way that those stories are ever going to be verified to a, to a degree that people would accept nowadays in terms of trying to get to the bottom of those stories. Um, so they're stories, 
And there are other ones in the war as well. There are a couple of German ones. There's a one that happens in Poland, but I'll leave them for the book. And ones that I haven't included in the book because they haven't beforehand, there's supposed to be a story of something that crashed in Poland in about either 37 or 38 that the Germans may have confiscated for some strange convoluted reason. And then, of course, there's a story of the, the craft in 1933 in Italy as well. So things did supposedly happen, but trying to get to the bottom of the information is a little, more, a little bit more difficult. The Polish case I mentioned there is about five or six pages in the book because it's quite detailed. It's probably the best one, but I'll leave that for readers. Absolutely. And that 1933 case is something I just discussed with Paolo Gazzardi in uh, the two-part interview, which has had a lot of great feedback in its early days of release. So again, thank you for everyone for checking that one out. Uh, listener questions, Graham, let's get to them. And I appreciate you. Graham was one of the early listeners to the podcast. So yeah. it's nice being able to have a listener on as a guest and put listener questions to it, a listener himself. Uh, the first question, Graham, is from Bickier. And Bikir says he doesn't actually know a lot about Foo Fighter sightings. Are there any similarities or differences to modern UFO sightings by pilots that stood out to you while doing research for the book? So if you cast your mind back to April this year and the debrief, I, I wrote an article for them which um, charted some of the similarities between some of the 1943 reports and the Tic Tac incident from two, in November 2004. And I know it wasn't a particular dogfight in, in the strictest sort of definition of the term, but in terms of an engagement where an air, you know, a modern day aircraft was chasing a, a, an unknown object round and round circles for a bit before it shot off, well, that actually happened in, in, in twice in 1943. So you had two instances where RAF fighter aircraft, well, one was a, um, one was a hurricane and one was a, a bow fighter, they were both actually operating at night, were chasing strange lights that either latched onto their tails or were following them. And in one case, the, the actual fighter pilot opened fire at the uh, at the light. Again, nothing happened. So, and that happened a few times over the course of the engagement. So, there are similarities in some of the cases from back then to now. They're not, you know, the kind of the exact same thing, but you can see that you know some vague similarities. And of course, throughout history, from the forties, fifties, and onwards. You know, uh, pilots were seeing strange craft at night and seeing lights that they couldn't understand and strange craft. Well, again, those kind of things were seen in the war as well, in general terms. So the, the phenomenon from the war is probably exactly the same uh, as, as the things that happened afterwards. Uh, really good question, Bakir. Thank you. Uh, James wants to know, do you have any plans for an audiobook version? Uh, this has been asked before. Um, yes, I would love to do an audio book version of it. It's just the planning and getting it done. Um, so it would have to be costed and seeing you know, what kind of market there was for it. But I have had people come to me with ideas and uh, offers of help. So if it does come into anything, then yes, I, I would love to get one out there. Put me down to read a couple of those pages for you, Graham. At That's minimal a cost, idea. a fraction of a cost than most people would charge you. Uh, a caramel Tyler, macchiato. <laughs> a caramel macchiato, <laughs> yeah, a venti caramel macchiato, as Graham knows I like to drink. Tyler wants to know, Graham, was there anything you found during your research for the book that really surprised you? Yeah, the, it was the breadth of the, the sightings because everything that was actually in the historical record that I could find before I started reading the book concentrated everything to about three main places in Europe. One was uh, Northern Italy, um, and the one, another part was uh, Western uh, Germany in Eastern Belgium, and another part of Western uh, Germany in Eastern France. So there was these three main areas. But actually, as I did more and more research and I found more and more cases, I found other hotspots. So I found one of the Balkans in, in right through 1944. And that surprised me because that was somewhere where it just hasn't been associated with Foo Fighter reports. And yet these were the same kind of sightings of strange lights that were following aircraft. In one point, one bomber was actually surrounded by six lights. And that happened two different times uh, over a period of about a week. And they're quite similar to the American stories from, from Belgium and from France. So that was a whole raft of new sightings, which were before the established start of the Foo Fighter reports that people knew about up until the mid-90s. But also it was sort of moving the phenomenon away from these recognized places to another part of Europe. So you can take from that that probably... The phenomenon was everywhere because I found reports from the Bay of Biscay right across the Eastern Front and from the North Cape of Norway right down to North Africa. So they were literally everywhere. 
And just let me follow up on that, um, Graham. You, your geography knowledge is far superior to mine. It, mine's just pretty poor. Were these objects seen over land, or were they generally on the coast or, or out at sea? So most of the, the cases I found were of aircraft which were flying over land. Uh, and that's just because, obviously, bombers were flying you know, mostly over, over Europe to hit targets in Germany and, and elsewhere. Now, there were a whole load of anti-submarine warfare squadrons which were flying over the North Atlantic and over the Bay of Biscay. Those squadron reports I haven't really gone into in much depth. I looked at a few, but because I was finding nothing, I didn't bother going through all of them because it, it sure. seemed a, a waste of time. However, I did find some, and there is one particular American report from November 1942, which happens over the Bay of Biscay, and that's why I mentioned that. And they had just sent aircraft to Cornwall that month and it was one of the first missions they ever flew, and they and a, a big light came up behind their aircraft and followed them, and that was um, they supposed to took photographs of it, but those photographs have never surfaced. So yes, there are stories over water, and there are a few others as well. There are stories from the Pacific, which I really won't go into because again, that's that beyond the focus of the book. But there are stories from from sailors on ships in the Pacific and in the Indian Ocean. So yeah, it, it, you know, it's everywhere basically. Now, I let you off pretty lightly earlier when I asked you potentially about what some of these objects may be or what the pilots thought <laughs> they might be. Now, Justin had a question, so I'm going to ask you a very similar question to what I asked you for, but through the, the vehicle of Justin. Uh, Justin says, with the new book out and everything you know or you've studied over your lifetime in this subject, what did you think the Foo Fighters were? And that doesn't mm -hmm. ask you what you think they weren't. Yeah, they're from Zeta Reticuli. No, I, look, I don't know. <laughs> I simply don't know. And you know, you can ask me whichever way you like. I'm, I'm not. I can't give you an answer. Um, I keep saying there's no experts in ufology. So anybody who tells you that they know exactly what's going on or they know the answer to that, then you know, run a mile because they don't usually. Um, or well, they don't because we can't know everything about an unknown phenomenon. So. You can only say what they're not, but you can't say what they are until somebody, until one of them literally lands in your lap, you know, lands on the on the White House lawn, or uh, there's a big, you know, big disclosure somewhere, or there's some more information comes out which leads us to actually knowing what they are. But at this stage, I'm afraid, you know, I'm going to chicken out and say, look, I don't know what they are because I don't, and I'm not going to make it up. I'm not going to go down some road and say what they are just for um, so I can put something out there because I read too many books like that in the 70s and 80s that, you know, people saw lights in the sky, so therefore they must be from Zeta Reticuli or this kind of thing. And you get the position where if you say things like that, you end up having to defend that position when new information comes along and you just look stupid. So I'm never going to put myself in that position, I'm afraid. I'd rather just, you know, sit back and say, look, I'm sorry, I, I don't know what they are. And if that if people don't, you know, don't buy the book for that reason or they don't think it's worth getting, then that's fair enough. But at least if you do look at it, You'll see what they're not, and that's just as valuable as find out what they are, because at least you can rule things out, and that leaves less, you know, kind of things to look at when you're going forward. Now, by process of elimination and whatnot, and and what you've looked at, what these things aren't uh, on a scale of one to five, one being extremely unlikely, five being extremely likely. Where would you sit on the possibility some of these objects being of non-human intelligence or origin? Ooh, I tell you, rather than answer that, I'm going to do a politician's. I'm going to give you a different answer, if that's all right. I've got a theory, but it's not a one which I subscribe to. It's just one that I'm, you know, pops into my head occasionally. I think, well, it's as good as any other. Let's say 500 years time, they, they invent a time travel machine. If I wanted to go back in history and look to a certain period of time in the past, World War II is where I'd go because that's what I'm interested in. So why wouldn't that work for somebody else? So you know, as theories go, that is one that could be is just as good. But equally, it could be it could be somebody from another dimension or from another place. So any theory is as good as any other. Um, but you know, as to which one is correct, who knows? It could be either of them. It could be none of them. It could be something completely different. So I'm, I'm you know, I'm going to just back out of that. I'm afraid. I'm I can't give you an answer. I'm sorry.
I love how you won't answer on aliens, but you're quite happy to throw out there that there's a chance it's future humans. Oh, uh, well, so, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I, don't, I didn't say I actually believe it. I just say, you know, that's one that keeps popping the head occasionally. But no, but you've done, you done that thing where you threw it out there, and of all the things you could have thrown out, there you go, folks, yeah, future yeah. humans, Graham Rendell's next book. Um, and we have a question <laughs> <laughs> We have a question to finish off before the quick fire round uh, from Dave. Dave sends me in a lot of really good questions as well. Uh, but he asks, um, has Graham done any work on the reported sightings of fleets of UAPs flying over the North Pole, Northern Europe, Russia in the 50s and early 60s? And the worries they uh, caused in terms of being misidentified as missiles and potentially starting a third world war? No, Dave, I haven't looked at those in any great detail. I've, I, I think I've got an idea which reports you, you, you're referring to. And yes, you're right. You know, that kind of thing would have been made people very, very nervous. And of course, you, you've got stories of, you know, um, missiles being turned off and turned on by, by, the, by these kind of objects uh, in the 70s. So there's a lot going on with that. But no, I'm afraid, you know, the focus of the book I wrote um, was purely and simply about the Second World War. But there are a lot of interesting stories about missiles, about aircraft, and about sightings of things over the pole, which demand attention. Um, someday I might get to that. Who knows? He also says that would be a good subject for a third or follow-up <laughs> book for you as well, Graham. It would. Um, you, you mentioned there just on the 60s and 70s that there were reports, of course, of missiles being turned on and off. Is that something you're aware of the any of the superpower nations or otherwise having that sort of technology to do that? Not that I'm aware of, um, because that would involve a whole range of things that they just wouldn't be possible because of the kind of fail safes and all these other things that you had to do to actually you know, to arm missiles and to fire them. Um, I can't see how another power will be able to do that short of having somebody actually an operative in the base, uh, you know, who could ferret away and, and change things. I can't see that somehow. I just don't see it. That's fair enough. So if those, if those reports are correct, you're looking at potentially some sort of non-human intelligence is what you're seeing, Graham. That's good something, to know. Something, something beyond our understanding anyway. <laughs> And let's finish up, Graham, with the quick fire round. Uh, a few topics that we've not got anywhere near, given we've went right back almost uh, eight eight decades in this discussion, which I've really enjoyed because it's been something that I wasn't too familiar with, and I'm I'm still nowhere near scratching the surface of the knowledge that you've got. But let's talk about very briefly a couple of other subjects. What are your thoughts on Bob Lazar? I blow hot and cold with Bob Lazar. I was at you know when he came out in was it nineteen eighty nine. Uh, I was really interested in the stories that came out then, and uh, I started hearing about more and more about his uh, background, etc., through the Desert Rat newsletter, which uh, Glenn Campbell did out of uh, Rachel Nevada in the early 1990s and the mid-1990s. So it was fascinating. And actually back then, I was more inclined to lap it up, just without question. Um, and then at times I've looked at things and thought, mm, okay, maybe that's not as kind of true as it, it's made out to. And then something else comes along and then I think, okay, you know, that's that's more like it. So I, I have a kind of love-hate relationship with Bob Lazar, even though I don't know the guy. It's just that, you know, I can't pin it down and I just don't know enough to actually satisfy myself one way or the other. So I'm just quite happy nowadays, just sit back and just wait for developments. And one day we'll find out one way or another. I'd like to believe, you know, that what he's saying is true. And I do believe George Knapp in, in what he says. So, um, you know, that's another thing which makes me kind of think, well, I really should believe this. But yeah, I'm just at the point where I sit on the fence, I'm afraid, like a lot of things. Your thoughts on Luis Elizondo? Wow. A guy who sacrificed a lot to come you know, with the information that he did to the table um, and all the kind of things he's endured since then, he's a better man than I ever could be. Your thoughts on Skinwalker Ranch, of course, this being right back in everyone's, uh, the forefront of our minds with the book released by Colm Kelleher, James Lukatsky and George Knapp. Funnily enough, I just finished that book today. Uh, I, was, uh, I read through it in, in a day. Um, hmm. There's definitely something going on there that's you know in incontrovertible. Uh, you could look at that and just think, oh, I wouldn't want to even go there and spend a night if that's the kind of thing that you know you take away things away from you and they come home with you. Having said that, I then looked at the of what some of the documentaries, you know, the the, the series about the was it the the hunt for Skinwalker, and they left me nonplussed 
the, the, I just wasn't that impressed with the way that the stories were told because it seemed to be done for a mass a mass audience in that particular style where they have recaps every ten every ten minutes and they have to do dramatized reconstruction and all that and that just left me cold I'm afraid. But in terms of you, you boil it down to what's going on, there's definitely something happening there and it's really weird. But I, I think we're going to have to wait and I think it's going to be one of those things that it might come out at some stage. But I think we're a long way off finding out what the hell's going on there. Do you prefer the term UFO or UAP? Well, I used to be old school and I liked UFO, but actually I'm quite getting around to the fact of UAP now. I use it a lot in the writing I do for UAP Media UK, so I have to say that really, don't I? But no, I am actually. I'm, I'm quite I'm quite happy with the new phrase. I mean, you could have called it UAPs before Roswell in that case. I could have, yeah, but that wouldn't have sold, would it? You can, you can do that in the next, <laughs> the next version, next generation of the book and correct it. Uh, finally, Graham, this is one we discussed earlier. There's a, a question that I think in the near future I'm going to phase out of the quickfire, and it's been a bit of a staple since the beginning. So one of the last uh, people I'm going to ask this to, what does disclosure mean to you? Capital D disclosure to me means, yes. you know, aliens landing on the White House lawn. Uh, little d disclosure is the kind of soft disclosure. So you get a drip feed of information that leads us to uh, an overwhelming conclusion that there's something going on. And to a point where the powers that be and the people who make the decisions can't hide it any longer and they've got to come clean. So that's the two kind of strands of disclosure that I think about. And, and what do you think we're getting, if any? We're getting the second. I don't think we'll ever get the first. I think that that time would have happened by now because of you know all the sightings that we've had over the last eighty years. I think if they were going to drop onto the White House lawn and announce themselves, like uh, the day the Earth stood still film, I think that would happen. I think that that time's gone. I think it's going to be a drip, drip, a, a very slow drip feed of information, which basically either backs the Pentagon or whoever into a corner to the point where they can't hide it anymore, and it'll come out. It might not come out straight away, but it'll come out into a form where people will go, yeah, there you go. And it might actually be quite underwhelming for people because they'll have had so much information, they'll have had so much time to assimilate it, but they'll get there. But I think that's how it'll come out. Graham, how can people follow you? And of course, how can they purchase your book? So the book's available on Amazon. Doesn't matter where you live in the world, whichever local Amazon service, whether it's .it or .uk or, or, or .com, whichever one you use, you can buy from there. If you search for my name, Graham Rendell, you'll find the book. You'll also find the Siberian book there. Um, as far as contacting me, well, at Border750 is my Twitter handle. There's a link tree reference on my profile there, and you can find out the things I've written about for other UAP issues and everything else to do with me is on, is on the profile there. And again, I'll thank you, Graham, on behalf of UAP Media, which you're a part of for the, for the work you do in that as well, which has been amazing since you came on board. You're a very welcome addition to the team. Um, what is next for you? Have you got any plans for a, a follow-up book? I do, yeah. I've, I've sort of doing the first tentative um, explorations into the Pacific War from the Foo Fighters. So there's a whole raft of sightings that happened from 1942 to 1945. And, and some of them are quite different. They're more to do with balls of fire. Uh, and strange lights rather than craft but as i dig into it who knows what i'll find excellent graham well i look forward to that and i know you'll be back on the podcast long before we see that second book anyway on, on ufos thanks. so thanks very much for your time graham thank you very much that is all for this week's show thank you very much for listening please remember to leave the podcast a review on your chosen platform you can like retweet and subscribe that would all be very much appreciated the shows are being uploaded onto youtube as we speak more and more you can sign up at patreon.com forward slash that ufo podcast to access shows ad free as well please get in touch on twitter facebook instagram that ufo podcast of course, on Twitter, it's at UFO, UAP, AM. And again, folks, as always, keep looking up. You never know what you might see. It wasn't a tic tac and not quite a saucer, more like a hubcap designed by Chaucer. A little baroque and quite steampunk, like Alice was playing bass for the Parliament of Fuck. The little fucker hovered right outside of my window, and when I shoved out the screen, he made it an issue. I don't think he expected me to see his ass, but I'd had some champagne and smoked a little more. Meditative game of fateful on meta. I can't imagine how it could have been any better. I got to the top of
the stairs and there he was. Like, you awake? I was about to abduct you, cuz. I jumped back and nearly kissed myself. Then I climbed out the window after the elf. And I woke up in my bed and there was something on my head. And everything was weird and everything was red. And I called up my boys. They thought this was noise. They thought it was a dream. They thought it was my toys. They thought it was my problems. And they think I should see care of me. And I don't know what it is because it doesn't really scare me. Thank you.